Chapter 17 of The Ghost, A Modern Fantasy by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 17. The Menace. From the moment of my avowal to Rosa, it seemed that the evil spirit of the dead Lord Clarenceau had assumed an ineffable dominion over me. I cannot properly describe it. I cannot describe it at all. I may only say that I felt I had suddenly become the subject of a tyrant who would punish me if I persisted in any course of conduct to which he objected. I knew what fear was, the most terrible of all fears, the fear of that which we cannot understand. The inmost and central throne of my soul was commanded by this implacable ghost, this ghost which did not speak, but which conveyed its ideas by means of a single glance, a single sneer. It was strange that I should be aware at once what was required of me, and the reasons for those requirements. Till that night I had never guessed the nature of the thing which for so many weeks had been warning me. I had not even guessed that I was being warned. I had taken for a man that which was not a man. Yet now, in an instant of time, all was clear down to the smallest details. From the primal hour when a liking for Rosa had arisen in my breast, the ghost of Lord Clarenceau, always hovering uneasily near to its former love, had showed itself to me. The figure opposite the Devonshire mansion, that was the first warning. With regard to the second appearance, in the Cathedral of Bruges, I surmised that that only indirectly affected myself. Primarily, it was the celebration of a fiendish triumph over one who had preceded me in daring to love Rosetta Rosa but doubtless also it was meant in a subsidiary degree as a second warning to the youth who followed in Aureska's footsteps. Then there were the two appearances during my journey from London to Paris with Rosa's jewels, in the train and on the steamer. Matters by that time had become more serious. I was genuinely in love, and the ghost's anger was quickened. The train was wrecked, and the steamer might have been sunk, and I could not help thinking that the ghost, in some ineffectual way, had been instrumental in both these disasters. The engine driver, who said he was dazed, and the steersman, who attributed his mistake at the wheel to the interference of some unknown outsider, were not these things an indication that my dreadful suspicion was well grounded? And if so, to what frightful malignity did they not point? Here was a spirit which in order to appease the pangs of a supernatural jealousy, was ready to use its immaterial powers to destroy scores of people against whom it could not possibly have any grudge. The most fanatical anarchism is not worse than this. Those attempts had failed. But now the aspect of affairs was changed. The ghost of Lord Clarenceau had more power over me now. I felt that acutely and I explained it by the fact that I was in the near neighbourhood of Rosa. It was only when she was near that the jealous hate of this spectre exercised its full efficacy. In such wise did I reason the matter out to myself. But reasoning was quite unnecessary. I knew by a sure instinct. All the dark thoughts of the ghost had passed into my brain, and, if they had been transcribed in words of fire and burnt upon my retina, I could not have been more certain of their exact import. As I sat in my room at the hotel that night, I speculated morosely upon my plight and upon the future. Had a man ever been so situated before? Well, probably so. We go about in a world where secret influences are continually at work for us or against us, and we do not suspect their existence because we have no imagination. For it needs imagination to perceive the truth. That is why the greatest poets are always the greatest teachers. As for you who are disposed to smile at the idea of a live man crushed, figuratively, under the heel of a ghost, I beg you to look back upon your own experience and count up the happenings which have struck you as mysterious. You will be astonished at their number. For nothing is so mysterious that is incapable of explanation, did we but know enough. I, by a singular mischance, was put in the way of the nameless knowledge which explains all. At any rate, I was made acquainted with some trifle of it. 
I had strayed on the seashore of the unknown and picked up a pebble. I had a glimpse of that other world which permeates and exists side by side with and permeates our own. Just now I used the phrase, under the heel of a ghost, and I used it advisedly. It indicates pretty well my mental condition. I was cowed, mastered. The ghost of Clarenceau, driven to extremities by the brief scene of tenderness which had passed in Rosa's drawing room, had determined by his own fell method to end the relations between Rosa and myself. And his method was to assume a complete sway over me, the object of his hatred. How did he exercise that sway? Can I answer? I cannot. How does one man influence another, not by electric wires or chemical apparatus, but by those secret channels through which intelligence meets intelligence? All I know is that I felt his sinister authority. During life, Clarenceau, according to every account, had been masterful, imperious, commanding, and he carried these attributes with him beyond the grave. His was a stronger personality than mine, and I could not hide from myself the assurance that in the struggle of will against will, I should not be the conqueror. Not that anything had occurred, even the smallest thing. Upon perceiving Rosa, the apparition, as I have said, vanished. We did not say much to each other, Rosa and I. We could not. We were afraid. I went to my hotel, I sat in my room alone, I saw no ghost. But I was aware, I was aware of the doom which impended over me. And already, indeed, I experienced the curious sensation of the ebbing of volitional power. I thought even that I was losing my interest in life. My sensations were dulled. It began to appear to me unimportant whether I lived or died. Only I knew that in either case I should love Rosa. My love was independent of my will, and therefore the ghost of Clarenceau, do what it might, could not tear it from me. I might die, I might suffer mental tortures inconceivable, but I should continue to love. In this idea lay my only consolation. I remained motionless in my chair for hours, and then, it was soon after the clock struck four, I sprang up and searched among my papers for Alreska's letter, the seal of which, according to his desire, was still intact. The letter had been in my mind for a long time. I knew well that the moment for opening it had come, that the circumstances to which Alreska had referred in his covering letter had veritably happened. But somehow, till that instant, I had not been able to find courage to read the communication. As I opened it, I glanced out of the window. The first sign of dawn was in the sky. I felt a little easier. Here is what I read. My dear Carl Foster, when you read this, the words I am about to write will have acquired the sanction which belongs to my utterances of those who have passed away. Give them, therefore, the most serious consideration. If you are not already in love with Rosetta Rosa, you soon will be. I, too, as you know, have loved her. Let me tell you some of the things which happened to me. From the moment when that love first sprang up in my heart, I began to be haunted by, I will not say what, you know, without being told, for whoever loves Rosa will be haunted as I was, as I am. Rosa has been loved once for all, and with a passion so intense that it has survived the grave. For months I disregarded the visitations, relying on the strength of my own soul. I misjudged myself, or rather, I underestimated my adversary, the great man who in life had loved Rosa. I proposed to Rosa, and she refused me, but that did not quench my love. My love grew, I encouraged it, and it was against the mere fact of my love that the warnings were directed. You remember the accident on the stage which led to our meeting? That accident was caused by sheer terror, the terror of an apparition more awful than any that had gone before. Still I persisted. I persisted in my hopeless love. Then followed that unnamed malady which in vain you are seeking to cure, a malady which was accompanied by innumerable and terrifying phenomena. The malady was one of the mind. It robbed me of the desire to live. 
More than that, it made life intolerable. At last I surrendered. I believe I am a brave man, but it is the privilege of the brave man to surrender without losing honour to an adversary who has proved his superiority. Yes, I surrendered. I cast out love in order that I might live for my art. But I was too late. I pushed too far the enmity of this spectral and unrelenting foe, and it would not accept my surrender. I have dashed the image of Rosa from my heart, and I have done it to no purpose. I am dying. And so I write this for you, lest you should go unwarned to the same doom. The love of Rosa is worth dying for, if you can win it. I could not even win it. You will have to choose between love and a life. I do not counsel you either way, but I urge you to choose. I urge you either to defy your foe utterly and to the death, or to submit before submission is useless. Aresca. I sat staring at the paper long after I had finished reading it, thinking about poor Alresca. There was a date to it, and this date showed that it was written a few days before his mysterious disease took a turn for the better. The communication accordingly needs some explanation. It seems to me that Alresca was mistaken. His foe was not so implacable as Alresca imagined. Alresca having surrendered in the struggle between them, the ghost of Lord Tanoso hesitated and then ultimately withdrew its hateful influence, and Aresca recovered. Then Rosa came again into his existence that evening at Bruges. Aresca, scornful of consequences, let his passion burst once more into flame, and the ghost instantly, in a flash of anger, worked its retribution. Day came, and during the whole of that day I pondered upon a phrase in Aresca's letter. You will have to choose between love and life. But I could not choose. Love is the greatest thing in life. One may, however, question whether it should be counted greater than life itself. I tried to argue the question calmly, dispassionately, as if such questions may be argued. I could not give up my love. I could not give up my life. That was how all my calm, dispassionate arguments ended. At one moment I was repeating, The love of Rosa is worth dying for. At the next I was busy with the high and dear ambitions of which I had so often dreamed. Were these to be sacrificed? Moreover, what use would Rosa's love be to me when I was dead? And what use would my life be to me without my love for her? A hundred times I tried to laugh, and said to myself that I was the victim of fancy, that I should see nothing further of this prodigious apparition, that that, in short, my brain had been overtaxed by recent events, and I had suffered from delusions. Vain and conventional self-deceptions. At the bottom of my soul lay always the secret and profound conviction that I was doomed, cursed, caught in the toils of a relentless foe who was armed with all the strange terrors of the unknown a foe whose onslaught it was absolutely impossible for me to parry. As the hours passed, a yearning to see Rosa to be near her came upon me. I fought against it, fearing I knew not what as the immediate consequence. I wished to temporise, or, at any rate, to decide upon a definite course of conduct before I saw her again. But towards evening I felt that I should yield to the impasse to behold her. I said to myself, as though I needed some excuse, that she would have a great deal of trouble with the arrangements for Sir Cyril's funeral, and that I ought to offer my assistance, that indeed I ought to have offered my assistance earlier in the day. I presented myself after dinner. She was dressed in black, and her manner was nervous, flurried, ill at ease. We shook hands very formally, and then could find nothing to say to each other. Had she, with a woman's instinct, guessed, from that instant's view of the thing in the chair last night, all that was involved for me in our love? If not all, she guessed most of it. She had guessed that the powerful spirit of Lord Caronso was inimical, fatally inimical, to me. None knew better than herself the terrible strength of his jealousy. I wonder what were her thoughts, her secret desires. 
At length she began to speak of commonplace matters. Guess who has called, she said with a little smile. I give it up, I said with a smile as artificial as her own. Mrs Sullivan Smith. She and Sullivan Smith are on their way home from Bayreuth. They are at the Hotel du Rhin. She wanted to know all about what had happened in the Routier, and to save trouble I told her. She stayed a long time. There have been a lot of callers. I am very tired. I, I expected you earlier. But you are not listening. I was not. I was debating whether or not to show her Alreska's letter. I decided to do so, and I handed it to her then and there. Read that, I murmured. She read it in silence, and then looked at me. Her tender eyes were filled with tears. I cast away all my resolutions of prudence, of wariness, before that gaze. Seizing her in my arms, I kissed her again and again. I have always suspected what, what Alreska says, she murmured. But you love me? I cried passionately. Do you need to be told, my poor Carl? She replied with the most exquisite melancholy. Then I'll defy hell itself, I said. She hung, passive, in my embrace. End of chapter 17